Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? There's a topic we've touched on in several previous episodes, but it seems to be cropping up more and more and taking on increased relevance. This time, let's talk about preserving the history of video games. So this is one of those thinking cap kind of episodes. I don't really have a hard opinion on any of the stuff that we're gonna talk about in this episode. I'm still trying to make up my own mind, but in doing some research and thinking about this one, I've come up with a number of points and counterpoints about this that I really just want to see used as food for thought. You can kind of churn around it in your head and use this information either to question your own current beliefs or use them to reinforce your beliefs or just come up with how you want to approach this topic because there is quite a bit of differing opinion out there. And the one thing that I have considered and generally come to consensus on is that I don't think any one particular answer is correct. With all that said, the topic of preserving video gaming history seems to really follow the kind of classic five W's and an H of any good story. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. So we might as well just discuss it that way. The first one is the what. What is preservation of video games and its history, and how do you go about doing it? Well, on its face, it's really pretty simple, right? It's just keeping that history of video games alive to not let any part of it get like lost or be forgotten to time. But of course, there's gonna be more to it than that. What's the scope? Do you preserve just the games themselves? Do you preserve the hardware that they played on? What about things like literature and promotional items that went along with those games and consoles? What about artifacts from the development process like source code or beta versions of games or interviews with the people who worked on those games, maybe the programmers or the artists? And then you have to consider the ramifications of defining scopes like that. The broader the scope, the more difficult it'll become to actually collect all of that stuff. I mean, it's easy to, in quotes, easy to have one of every game for a given console. I mean, there are people who have already done that, have complete collections. But it's going to be a lot harder to find all of the stuff like posters and magazine articles and promotional giveaways and toys and that kind of stuff that goes along with those games. And the deeper into it you get, the broader you make that scope, the harder and harder it's gonna be fine. And some of that information, sadly, is lost forever. For example, maybe there were software developers and artists who worked on games in the 80s who are no longer alive today, who never had their stories get documented. There are pieces that we already have lost that really kind of goes into, well, what type of scope do you want to define? Now, we'll talk a little bit more about scope towards the end of the episode, but it's just something to think about. The next one is the how. Something where there are a lot of different options, right? You can look at it from a few different perspectives. The how, some believe that all that really matters is just the software itself, right? Like the, the ones and zeros that make up the game. And so to them, like playing a ROM file in an emulator is just fine, it's good enough. And that's a perfectly valid opinion to have. But others think that the original media and the original hardware is just as important and that those games really should be played kind of given the same experience as when they were new. So it's not to them just good enough to be playing a ROM in emulation because that doesn't necessarily give you the complete experience as to what that game was all about, what people who originally played that game went through. We certainly see both of these philosophies with the rise of retro gaming today and people just getting into, you know, retro games for themselves. But it's 
also important to consider that for preservation purposes because there are definite ramifications. A digital only approach such as ROMs and playing them in emulators and then, you know, for additional media, maybe just scanning it to files, uh, you know, like scanning the, the original paper manuals for games into like just PDFs and storing them in digital format and all that. Well, it's, it's likely going to be the best for the very long term. If you're thinking hundreds of years out, arguably these digital approaches may actually be the best in terms of keeping things preserved, keeping them alive, simply because they can be backed up. Once it's in digital format, it can be easily format shifted and moved on to new storage media as time goes on. So you can back up ROMs, you can move them from one hard drive to another or from a server to out in the cloud or back again or stored on some other form of long-term archival media. You can make many, many copies of that data to help preserve it so that you don't have a single point of failure in one piece of hardware that may die or just, you know, deteriorate with age. It's also going to make that material more accessible to people. Once it's in digital format, it's way easier to get it out there, especially with the internet. And we've seen this really kind of present itself and show its importance with the relatively recent crackdown that Nintendo has been doing against ROM sites. We talked about that in a previous podcast episode, and I saw in a lot of comments on that particular video about people saying, you know, that's their primary source for playing these retro games for one reason or another. So there's some definite arguments in favor of just looking at this digital only approach, dumping the cartridges, ripping the original game CDs or discs and putting them in digital format, preserving them that way. But a physical approach such as keeping those original cartridges and those consoles and then even peripherals that go with them like period accurate CRT televisions, well, that arguably gives you the most authentic, in quotes, experience. It's the technology that was around when the game was developed. So you're playing it in the way that the programmers intended or envisioned. It can also give more context to the era in which the game was released. You're not just experiencing the game itself you're also kind of getting a taste as to the time period. A great example would be, you know, today you play a modern game, let's say on an emulator, while well, you're just firing up the emulator on your computer or on a mobile device, something like that. If you're playing on period accurate hardware, you're suddenly learning or remembering, oh yeah, that's right. In order to play this game, I have to, you know, get this, controller and plug it in, but also I've got to remember the console is hooked up to the TV through an RF modulator because that's all that was available at the time. So you have to remember to set the TV to channel three, you know, that sort of thing. It's, it's a period accurate kind of representation of what that game was about and what playing games was about during that era. So there are some downsides, of course, to taking that approach. One is just going to be, well, you need some place to store all of that stuff, arguably way cheaper to store it in digital format than it is to like have a facility to keep all of this stuff. Plus, there's a cost to actually obtaining all of it, right? You need to go out and buy all of this stuff somehow, find it from somewhere. Plus, you need to deal with and have concerns about things like repairs and upkeep and accepting ultimately the inevitable failure of some of this hardware. Some of it's already kind of touchy. You know, circuits degrade, components start to fail over time, even if they're not being used. And so that's going to be a factor is... If you go with that hardware only approach, there are some definite benefits to it. But at the same time, because these are electronic items, they do have a finite life. So 
there's going to be some cost in not just keeping them running for today, but also realizing that at least playing some of that stuff on its original hardware is going to have a bit of a finite life. Yes, you could probably take, you know, game cartridges and stick them in a museum and display them for hundreds of years, but hundreds of years from now, I'm not so sure that those games would actually be playable, especially when you have to consider that it's not just the game cartridges or discs or whatever that have to be playable, but you've got to have a working console and working period other stuff to go with it. So some major some major contention there, I guess, from a preservation kind of standpoint. The who, the when, and the where. Well, when it comes to game preservation, there's really no official or authoritative like gaming history museum. That said, there are a number of gaming related museums out there and they come in all sorts of sizes and some of which actually go back many years. Uh, game preservation isn't necessarily a relatively new thing. Some people have been very forward thinking about it. And so some of these gaming preservation efforts, these museums that have sprung up have been around for quite a while. But ultimately these facilities, I think are gonna tend to come and go. They're gonna change form, they're gonna change hands. Some of them may run out of funds and simply close. Some of them may end up undergoing dramatic changes or otherwise end up getting destroyed. You know, maybe they were in some building that caught on fire and the entire collection got lost. They, the, the gaming museums like that don't really seem to have, I guess you could say the established presence of something like an art museum where you know, things like art museums, you look at them and they have quite a bit more funding because the perception is it's a cultural asset that the majority of people can get behind. So they're so important that the money has been spent to preserve them. Basically, I, I don't think that retro gaming yet holds the same cultural importance as something like those famous paintings or sculptures. So there's always gonna be kind of this loose effort to try and preserve all of that. People doing the best they can and not to say that they're not doing a good job, they absolutely are. They're doing the best they can with what they have, but until the, the, you know, the public treats video games as an equally important cultural asset as things like art and movies and music, it's always going to be kind of a scramble to try and keep all of these preservation efforts going. And the upside to all of this, however, is it doesn't necessarily have to be this kind of you know formal organized kind of thing. It doesn't have to be where you need to start this museum to keep all the stuff. We're actually seeing that going on already by individuals starting up collections like in their basements for their own satisfaction, really. They're kind of creating their own private museums. And it makes one wonder if perhaps this crowdsourced kind of approach isn't maybe the best way to do it. Maybe instead of trying to have that one like monolithic collection that is the complete history of video games or whatever, maybe you just kind of let it all shake out into its own categories. You know, you let people gravitate towards what their interests are and let those collections get, you know, grown and presented that way. Maybe someone, you know, develops a, a complete representative history of Nintendo games and somebody else has a major focus on Sega games or Sony games or Microsoft games, whatever. Maybe instead they look at it by era. This is a complete history of 8-bit gaming and 16-bit gaming and, and that sort of thing. You know, maybe instead of trying to make video game preservation be a formal thing, we just let it naturally evolve. We let the community itself handle that preservation effort and you know, ultimately, with the varying tastes that there are out there, uh, 
ultimately a decent percentage of it is going to get collected and preserved. So maybe it's not just about the physical part of it though. Maybe it's not just the games themselves, but also the, the context. And I think that's kind of the, the next major part of this who, when, and where is you, you've got some who are actually preserving the games themselves, keeping these big collections and all that, but others are preserving gaming history in other ways. You've got some who are focusing on the stories of the games rather than just the games themselves. And in some ways, I think these storytellers are perhaps doing the most important work. People who write books like Pat the NES Punk with his like complete guide to all of the games that came out for the NES. Or those who produce retrospective videos uh, like The Gaming Historian and others here on YouTube. They're not just presenting the game itself, but also explaining how it fits in. Not just in relation to other games, but also the time period. They're giving it some context. They're talking about maybe how it came to be or how it had an impact on society. Kind of letting that story dribble out just beyond gaming, but more into what other impacts and effects did it have on society during that time period. I think that can be very interesting information and serves to provide that additional context that I think is necessary to fully understand and learn about the history of this kind of stuff. I mean, like you go to a museum, how useful would a museum be if all it had were just all these artifacts just sitting there with no other information, just presenting like, here's this thing we dug up out in the woods one day. Okay, what, it, what is it? When is it from? What was it used for? Sometimes that additional information, the plaques next to those artifacts in the museum can be just as important as the artifact itself. So I really like the concept of this additional preservation of it, not just being, you know, shelves upon shelves of games, but also people doing that research to figure out how it all fits in. Now, perhaps the biggest question about gaming preservation is going to be why? The answer that I've always found when people have asked why we should preserve games is simply so that it can be used to educate or pass on knowledge to future generations. So people can learn about what led up to maybe the games of today. That's certainly one factor and certainly a big factor, but as I've sat and thought about it, I don't think it's the only one. I think, of course, as we've talked about in many podcast episodes, nostalgia is going to be a factor. It gives people an opportunity to go back and relive their youth or relive another time period. Maybe that had significance to them. Maybe gaming was an important part of their life at one point. Maybe not so much now, but by having all this stuff be preserved, it gives them an opportunity to go back and jog some of those memories and put on those rose colored glasses and, and have good feelings about it again. It also, I think, fosters a really good sense of community. I mean, yes, there are people who are collecting games in their basement and doing it on their own, keeping it to themselves. But a lot of those people are also engaged with other collectors or maybe collectors getting together to try to form those video game museums. It, it gives an opportunity for people to get together and share information and knowledge. And that ultimately helps to foster collecting and preservation even further because you can fill in those knowledge gaps. There's only so much one person can learn on their own doing their own research, if you get multiple people doing different parts of research who have different sets of knowledge and memories and you put them all together, now you can have a much more comprehensive story and picture to show. For some private collectors, there's of course curiosity, but there's also the thrill of the hunt. I think for private collectors, thrill of the hunt is actually a big factor to it. 
And it's easy to get sucked into something like that, even if it's not the whole, I want to collect one of everything of this type of mentality, but even uh, I've always wanted one of these types of things. And I've fallen into this myself where I've thought, you know what, I always wanted one of this specific thing. It's exciting to try and go out and find that, to try and to find the best one. Maybe it's incredibly rare trying to find one. I'm actually working on another video now, not necessarily related to video games, but of a fairly rare item today that fits into computing history. And there was definitely a bit of a thrill of the hunt kind of thing going on as I tried to find one of those because turns out these days it's actually quite rare, difficult to find. So there's there's that additional aspect to it of of that drive, that initiative to, you know what, I want one of every one of these. I want to collect this kind of stuff. Yeah, maybe preservation isn't the first thing on their mind, but by putting all that together, by actually making a collection of it, you are de facto preserving it. Instead of just having a couple of random onesie twosie loose cartridges sitting in your closet, you're much more inclined to take care of a large collection like that if you spent money, of course, but also a lot of time and energy, both physically and emotionally, into putting all that together. But I think maybe another important thing to consider is coming back to that question of scope. Should everything be collected? Some would argue yes. Some would argue that we need to have as complete a picture as possible, that we should have a, a collection somewhere of every single video game that's ever been released that these video gaming museums should have complete collections of all of the titles and they should be keeping backups of all that. Maybe they should keep multiple copies of all that just so nothing gets lost to time. Certainly a valid way to look at it. And there are definite advantages to keeping all of that because you're not losing any of it. You're not letting any bits of that history slip into oblivion potentially permanently you always have that to go back to, so you can always use it for comparisons and and looking at where we were and where we're going. You know, the, the whole adage about, you know, you need to understand your past in order to keep from repeating mistakes in the future, that sort of stuff. But others actually might argue no, that we don't necessarily need to collect everything. And I think people who would argue with that would point to other forms of media as an example, as to how you can get away with it. You would look at things like music and movies, and over time, generally only the most popular of those forms of media have generally survived, despite the fact that it's relatively easy to preserve them, considering you can format shift that stuff pretty you know, pretty straightforward. You know, uh, cassettes and reel-to-reel -reel tapes and vinyl records for music easily format shifted into new modern forms. I mean, they still sell vinyl record players today that have USB ports on them, specifically designed for hooking up to your computer and preserving your old vinyl records because a lot of these older forms of media that weren't quite so popular were never reissued in new formats. So the original format that they were in, that's likely the only one that they will ever be in. And of course, numbers of those are going to dwindle. So you've got people taking it upon themselves, kind of like with you know video game preservation, to go and look at some of this media and try to bring it into the modern age, if for no other reason than for their own enjoyment. Maybe it's one of their favorite songs or favorite music albums by a relatively unknown artist, and they just want to keep it because they know someday that vinyl record copy that they have that's incredibly rare, it's going to wear out, something like that. But in general, in terms of the mass you know, consumption of media, only the most popular stuff has survived and been brought into the modern era. You look at like, you know, digital remastering of vintage albums that were repressed onto CD and now into high res digital formats for download over the internet, that kind of thing. You're not gonna have the complete collection of 
you know, human music and, and art and all that available, a lot of it has fallen out, but we've still kind of survived. And I think part of the argument as to why that's okay is because by preserving everything, you give it all equal weight in a way, equal importance. Future generations are gonna look at this collection and at a glance not really know what was good and what wasn't. In a way, the stuff that survived has been the best and it served to be it's the, the best representation of its time, of its genre, of its era. And I think maybe that could hold true for gaming. I mean, yes, there have been absolutely amazing, fantastic classic retro games out there, but there have been an equal, if not greater number of absolutely horrible retro games out there that may be interesting for a minute or two, but aren't really worth, you know, putting on a pedestal alongside all those other good games. So maybe the argument behind not collecting everything, not preserving everything is it's better to focus one's efforts on the most popular stuff, on the most important stuff, because then you can give what you do preserve the best attention that you can. You can go deeper into it. You can look at some of those additional artifacts, maybe try to find some of that beta code or get in touch with some of the original programmers or artists, whatever, to get their stories instead of spreading yourself thin, trying to absolutely collect just everything. Opinions, of course, are going to be all over the place. There's probably going to be an equal number of people saying we need to collect everything as there will be people saying, no, that's not quite so important. As, as I said earlier at the beginning, I haven't really made up my own mind yet, but I will admit, I think that the general hysteria that occasionally pops up about, oh my God, we need to preserve everything now, otherwise it's going to be lost forever. <sighs> that's a bit overblown. We saw that sentiment kind of creep up with the whole Nintendo taking down uh, the ROM sites, you know, sort of thing from, from a few episodes ago. I don't think that's truly going to be the case. I, I don't think we're necessarily going to get to a point where we have to preserve absolutely everything right now. Otherwise, poof, it's all going to disappear. Uncommon games and other artifacts from video gaming history they're still going to be around in the future. Maybe not in such great numbers, but maybe by taking a more methodical approach to preservation, we can, I guess, in some ways save some discoveries for later. I guess a great example would be take that whole Sony, Nintendo, PlayStation prototype thing from when those two companies were working together, where Sony was going to develop a basically optical drive for the Super Nintendo console. And then it kind of morphed into maybe collaborating on a standalone console kind of thing. And famously, that deal fell apart where Nintendo realized that Sony was going to be way better off in that agreement than Nintendo was, and it broke off the deal and kind of burned Sony in the process. Well, Sony had already started working on a lot of different prototypes, but none of them really made it out into the public at the time. That was a project that just kind of got quickly buried, disappeared, and we know the story about how Nintendo kind of burned Sony at the last minute, but it just kind of stopped there. What's more exciting? Taking that whole, we need to preserve everything now type of approach and knowing that, you know, after Nintendo broke ties with Sony, went with Philips on the whole optical drive thing, and Sony had these prototypes that those prototypes immediately went out to the public. So they were documented and visible and everyone knew about them and we would have known about them for a long time versus what actually happened where they disappeared, they were buried. And then 20 plus years later, suddenly this one prototype just pops up seemingly out of nowhere. And now we've got this, 
huge story that's really interesting and really curious about, well, maybe there was more to what happened than what had previously been published and told. By letting some stuff stay buried, maybe you're saving some excitement for later. Maybe you're letting people down the line get some of that excitement from discovering something new about something old. I guess there's really no right answer to any of this. I think maybe in the end, the best approach is to kind of split it down the middle for all of the different, you know, who, what, when, where, why that we've talked about. That there isn't necessarily one perfect way to go, that it's always going to be just kind of this loose collection of people doing their own things in different scales and capacities. But I do at least like to think that, you know, maybe maybe there is some merit to not being quite so fanatical about preservation, but, you know, maybe rather just enjoying the ride. Anyway, I'm curious as to your thoughts on this whole one. Are you of the mindset where you think absolutely everything needs to get preserved and even all of the brand new games that come out now, we need to gather up everything about them and you know pack them away into museums and archives and keep them for the future? Or is it you know more of a loose thing? Maybe we should be pickier about what we preserve. I, I'm just curious as to what you think. So be sure to leave your thoughts down in the comments below. Also, if you're interested in audio only versions of these podcasts, I have them available as plain MP3 downloads for Patreon supporters. As little as a dollar a month gets you access. It's just a plain file you can download. Plus there's private RSS feed support. Throw it into the podcast player of your choice. And these episodes typically go live a few days before they show up on YouTube. It's a great way to support the channel. Just something to think about. Anyway, if you like this one, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThisDoesNotComp. And as always, thanks for watching. Thank you.